Thai word for intelligence is a combination of two Pali words, the words for mindfulness and discernment, sati banya. And the Jains like to talk a lot about applying your sati banya, applying your intelligence to the meditation. The question is, what kind of intelligence are we talking about? Here it's good to look at the canon, when the Buddha talks about how mindfulness leads to discernment, and how the two go together. He basically says that as you're practicing the four establishings of mindfulness, you're also completing the seven factors for awakening. The first three of those factors are mindfulness, analysis of qualities, which is the discernment factor, and then persistence. You start out, say, with the body, focusing on the breath, where the focus, and you stay focused on the breath in and of itself, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. Mindful, of course, means keeping things in mind. Alert means noticing what you're doing while you're doing it, and ardent means trying to do it well. And it's there that things connect up with the discernment. You want to be mindful of the right things, alert to the right things. You can be mindful of anything in the past. After all, it is a faculty of memory. But you want to manage your memory well. What's going to be appropriate to remember right now, you apply that. What's not appropriate, you put it aside. Same thing with alertness. You could be alert to anything at the moment, but here the Buddha is having you stay alert to what you're doing. As for being alert to anything else, you put it aside. Notice there's the question of what's skillful and what's not. This relates very directly to that sutta where the Buddha is talking about how he first got on the path. He developed right resolve to keep in check any thoughts that might wander off out of sensuality, ill will, harmfulness, and to allow his mind to think only things that were coming out of renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness, because of the effect that would have on the mind. He looked at his thoughts in terms of cause and effect, not in terms of what he liked or didn't like, but what was going to be useful. And that's the same approach we take to mindfulness. There are certain things you could keep in mind right now that would be entertaining or maybe useful for tomorrow's job, whatever work you've got to do tomorrow. But you realize those are not appropriate right now. What you want to keep in mind is what lessons you've learned from the past about how to stay with the breath, what lessons you've learned about the hindrances as they come up, what lessons you've learned about developing the good qualities of concentration. Because those thoughts will be useful. And this fits right in with what the Buddha said about how mindfulness leads to the factor of analysis of qualities. Because that's all about noticing what in the mind is skillful and what's not. So that's where the discernment comes in. It's practical discernment, pragmatic discernment, the discernment that's useful for doing what's right right now. This is illustrated by the Buddhist analogy of the way you plow a field. Mindfulness is the goad. In case you're not familiar with how they plow fields with goads, you have your ox hooked up to the plow. And the ox is pulling the plow, and it might go off to the left, it might go off to the right. You're trying to keep it straight, so you've got a stick with a point at the end of the stick. And if the ox goes to the right, you poke it in the right to get it back to the left. And if it turns to the left, you poke it on the left side to get it back to the right. So here you're not like that image that the Buddha had for right result, which is simply knowing when to keep the cows out of the rice and when you don't have to keep the cows out of the rice fields. You've got more detailed work trying to plow a straight furrow. And 
And so this is where all the different established things of mindfulness come in. And the basic one, whether you're sitting and meditating or whether you're out and about, is you just stay with the body. But then based on that, you might pull in some of the other frames of reference as well, because after all, they're all right here. Body, feelings, mind, qualities in the mind. It's simply a question of which list of qualities is relevant to what you're doing. When you're out and about, your main concern is with restraint of the senses. What you're looking at, how you're looking at it, what you're listening to, how you're listening to it, what happens as a result. And there the Buddha says it's like having six animals on leashes. And you just tie the leashes to other leashes, the animals can pull one another in all sorts of directions. Whichever animal is strongest, and the image she has is the crocodile, and there's a monkey, and there's a dog, and there's a jackal, there's a bird, and there's a snake. And of those, the strongest is probably the crocodile, so it's going to pull every, every other animal down into the water, they all drown. But if you tie the leashes to a stake, and the stake is firmly planted in the ground, then pull as they might, they're just going to stay there right next to the stake. So you stay grounded with the body as you go through the day. And you start thinking in terms of the fetters and the six senses. When you're looking at something, are you fettering yourself by the way you look? Is that what you want to do? In other words, if there's passion for what you're looking at, there can be passion either in a positive way or passion in the sense of being aversive. Is that the effect you want? Because here again, you're looking at things in terms of cause and effect, not in terms of your likes or dislikes. When you're sitting here meditating, again, you're grounded with the body, with the breath. But here you're more interested in terms of the hindrances, which hindrances are arising right now, how you get past them, and with the factors for awakening, how you give give rise to them if they're not there, how you maintain them when they are. Of course, when you're doing this, making this distinction between what's skillful and what's not, and trying to do what's skillful, that automatically brings in the third factor for awakening, which is persistence. You know, the wisdom of the intelligence of persistence is knowing that certain things, you, again, you look at them in terms of cause and effect. And there are certain things you like doing, but you know the ultimate effect is not going to be good. You learn how to talk yourself into not doing them. And at first it may require some force to force yourself not to do them. But then you realize it's a lot wiser if you can talk yourself into wanting not to do them. And the same with things that you don't like to do, but they're going to have good results in the long term. Talk yourself into wanting to do them. Getting yourself psyched up to sit longer, to sit more often, to pay closer attention to what you're doing as you meditate, and not just drift off in a pleasant feeling. So it's in this way that mindfulness and discernment go together. It's a pragmatic coupling, realizing that there are Things that have got to be done, skills have to be mastered, and doing your best to master them. That's intelligence. This is very different from the way you often hear how mindfulness is connected to discernment. It's often said that when we practice mindfulness, we're trying to see things in terms of the three characteristics. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes it's not. Of all the wisdom teachings. The three characteristics are the ones that, both in the canon and in the teachings of the Ajans, there are warnings that say you have to be very careful about when you apply them and when you're not, because they're very easy to misappropriate. The teaching on inconstancy. And John Lee has a nice passage where he says that people see that things are inconstant, so they just 
say, okay, I'm going to leave them alone, not get involved. He said, it's like having a wound in your body. You say, well, the wound isn't permanent. You just leave it. Well, it's just going to get worse. It's going to get infected. You create more trouble for yourself. You see that it's wounded. Okay, you put medicine on it, you wrap it with a bandage, and the wound can heal. That's the intelligent way of dealing with it. The same with stress. You see, well, this is a hard practice. It's taking a lot out of me. Just thinking about getting the mind concentrated is, is very wearisome. Well, you're never going to get the mind concentrated. And the duty with regard to concentration is to give rise to it and to develop it. In terms of self or not self. In the canon, there's a case where a monk decides so if the five aggregates are self, there must be nobody doing anything, and there's nobody going to be affected by what's done by what's not self. So you can do anything you want. And the Buddha chastises him. There are plenty of other examples. And John Shah has one where he says, You've got a cup. And you say, Well, the cup is impermanent, so just do what you want, throw it around. We don't get use of the cup. You take care of it. Well, there's a case in the can where someone reasons that all actions result in feeling, all feelings are stressful, so all actions result in stress. And as the Buddha points out, that's going to lead people to say, well, it doesn't matter what I do. So the three characteristics, or the three perceptions, are things we have to know the right time and place. In other words, they have to fit into the skills of the Four Noble Truths. That's when you use them intelligently. So this is the kind of intelligence we're trying to develop as we, as we practice, the pragmatic intelligence, one where we look at our memory and say, what in my memory is useful for right now? What's not useful? Focus only on the things that are useful. And those good memories will tell you, okay, what right now is skillful? How do you recognize what's skillful coming up in the mind? How do you recognize what's not skillful? How do you remember what to do? And if you can't remember, how do you figure out using your ingenuity? How do you figure something out? What is it similar to? That's using your memory in an intelligent way. So use your intelligence as you practice. Look at what you're doing. Take it as a skill. You're trying to plow your field properly. Make sure the furrows are straight. And then you get the crops that you want. Pleasure, rapture, part of the path. And then the higher crops. If you just let your cow wander around as it likes, say, well, the cow is impermanent, where it goes is impermanent. That's not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get any crops at all. So the Buddha offers us all these tools, and we have all these potentials within ourselves. And it's when we recognize what's happening right now as having potentials and not just being something we have to accept. You accept that it's there, but also you accept the fact that it has potentials. You work on those potentials. That's when you're showing intelligence in your practice.